say I give you my, uh, my, my two cents on short sales, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Denise and Bill, which are in good hands at that point. But um, so a little bit of background on, on what we're talking about today is I love to lean into to both Denise and Bill. They've, they've uh, handled a number of my clients. They've handled a number of clients for our brokerage already. Um, my background in, in having done real estate for 22 years is I've done hundreds of short sales on my own. So I would consider myself to be an expert at being able to do short sales. How, with that being said, I would never in a million years do another short sale. The moment that I met Bill and Denise, I'm like, what am I, what brain damage have I been doing to myself the last 20 something years doing short sales on my own? So it, it's kind of the equivalent of if you went to your, your doctor, your general practitioner, and you're in the waiting room um, and, uh, and you pass out, you know what your, your doctor's office is going to do? They're going to call an ambulance to take you to the, to the ER. They're, they're not going to help you. I mean, I mean, could they help you? Do they have the know-how to help you? The answer is absolutely, but that's not their area of expertise. Likewise, you wouldn't go to your general practitioner and say, hey, um, can you do open heart surgery? Listen, they're, they're, he's a physician and he, he, and, and he might be degreed enough to kind of know his way around, but is that his area of expertise? Absolutely not. And so likewise, I would recommend highly that we lean into experts in their field. And, and certainly Denise and Bill have uh, more than proven that by specializing in short sales. Um, you know, from short sales, uh, it kind of evolves over time. But the things that were in the market that we're heading into, you guys are going to see this with uh, loan programs from your clients that have done VA loans, FHA loans, USC, USDA loans, just to name a few of the the high risk category, and there are others as well, but that's a high risk category. And a short sale is in the pile of distressed properties, right? So it's it's on its path, on its way to being a foreclosure, on its way to being a bank owned property, um, a real estate owned property. In the beginning, it's, it's they've defaulted, they're late, but in addition to it, they may be short and with uh, prices being compressed, they may be upside down. So we can absolutely help those clients, but there's a certain way to go about it. And I, and I can tell you, there are, there are agents that um, some, maybe some that are on this call that have done short sales before, just because you've done it and you know what to do, doesn't mean that it's worthwhile for you to do. And the first experience that I had with working with Denise, and this is maybe five years ago or so, yeah. six years or something like that is, and again, I know short sales. Um, I know contracts. Uh, you know, I'm not um, ignorant to, to that at all. She not only saved that transaction from going sideways. You remember, remember that we got a huge bill from the law firm and she's like, no, no, they can't. She's up to date on all the different, and she's not an attorney, but she's up to date on the current rules and laws and situations. She knows um, some of the tolerances of what we were able to offer for different uh, lenders that are holding that. No, there's all these different nuances that happen behind the scenes that are outside of our of our expertise in our world. We don't do that every day and yet they do. Um, and so I would highly recommend, and, and we get nothing for it. We're not in partnership with them except for they're absolutely the best. And I would recommend the best for you guys as agents, but also recommend the best for our clients. And here's um, what this means for us is, a short, I love short sales, by the way. I know that sounds weird. I, I love them because they're a permanent billboard for a real estate agent because it doesn't. it's not a, a transaction that's gonna close in 30 days. It's a transaction that sometimes might close in, in 90, if you're lucky, six months, kind of in, in between there, 90 to six months. Um, and if it's really a problem, you might have it for a lot longer, but that's a billboard that real estate agents get as a marketing tool to get eyeballs on who you are. So there's a value in short sales, but you gotta, but besides the, the marketing piece of it, we have a fiduciary responsibility to take care of our clients and, and walk that process to, uh, to getting it closer to closing. And that's where, where Bill and, and Denise come in. So um, I couldn't speak uh, highly enough for these two. They're, they're quality people. They're super uh, wonderful people. They're easy to talk to. They're, they're very professional. They get back to us on a timely uh, manner and they're on the East Coast and I'm sure they're dying to come visit us in person one of these days. Uh, but without <laughs> further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, De Denise and Bill. So thank you so much for, for pouring into us today, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chad. And I, I see some fam familiar names on here. So thank you all for attending today. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity to come in. Chad invites us to update everyone. So um, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start it off 
And then Denise is going to jump in a little bit later on, but we have prepared um, an overview for everybody. And um, uh, just if you can, if you have questions, uh, use the chat function. I'm assuming that's what's preferred. Or you can unmute yourself, ask your question. Um, let's try and learn from each other. But um, Denise and I are going to give you an update on what we're seeing in the market as it relates to, um, uh, I'll say, the hangover from the CARES Act Mortgage Forbearance Program. We're starting to see more issues arise that are causing settlements to be delayed. So we're going to go over that for starters. And then we're going to review um, some statistical data on the actual foreclosure activity um, in your local market. Um, and I'm also going to spend a little bit of time um, showing you how you can actually locate um, uh, foreclosure properties to market and list to. OK, and then Denise is going to close with more than nuts and bolts of what is a short sale, um, how does it work and things that you need to, to, to focus in on as if you are representing a listing client, just things that you need to do to protect yourself. OK, but we welcome we welcome the conversation. We welcome the questions. All right. So for starters, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, and then I'll open this up. All right, fantastic. So, so for those of you that, that have not worked with us before, um, just at a high level, um, Chad mentioned he's worked with Denise for several years now. Um, Denise and I uh, started our company um, uh, many, many years ago. I think this year, I think next year, June will mark 21 years that we've been facilitating short sales. So they've been around such a long time. And, um, and, and the reason they've been around for such a long time is that as market values go up and they go down, um, you always have distressed homeowners. And, and you know what is a distressed homeowner? We're gonna cover later what mortgage companies, the Bank of America's of the world, the JP Morgan Chase's of the world, Wells Fargo's of the world, what do they require from a homeowner to demonstrate hardship? Okay. But, you know, by way of background, um, Denise and I started our company uh, 20 years ago. Our role is to assist listing agents and their sellers when that homeowner is upside down on their mortgage, meaning the value of the home is less than what they can sell it for and pay off all their debt in full. And, you know, this this last couple of years have been really, really crazy. You know, market values are continuing to go up like that. And then here we are talking about distressed property owners being upside down on the mortgage. Um, but the reality is, you know, as folks, you know, as the market normalizes, OK, and, and, and instead of going like this, we're kind of like this now. But as the market normalizes and then starts to adjust with, you know, with a reduction, um, then we are going to see some folks that maybe in the last two years overpaid dramatically because they were in a competitive situation. We're starting to see that now. Denise and I'll give you a couple examples of it. But at a high level, the realtors identify um, a client that's distressed. A listing agent reaches out to Denise or I. Um, we have a team of people in our offices here um, uh, on the East Coast. But Denise and I will consult with the homeowner. We want to make sure that we're educating your seller on the benefits of a short sale versus a foreclosure. Um, foreclosure results in a judgment being held against that homeowner. Um, and, and, and if the homeowner does let the property foreclose and the bank take it back, well, it's going to really impede that, that person's ability to get a new mortgage for a minimum of five upwards of seven years. So we're going to walk you through that. But the goal really is to help you assist clients without any extra effort on your behalf and maximizing your commission as a realtor. So in essence, um, there's a, a, a part of, the, of, a, of a sale process in a short sale. Um, one is, you know, get the property on the market. All right. The end result is you go to settlement. The middle part is what Denise and, and I do, what our company does. 
is we'll take that offer, we'll present it to Bank of America. Bank of America, for an example, um, they'll do a financial review on the seller. Think of it like the unmortgage, all right? When someone applies for a mortgage, they provide proof of income, pay stubs, bank statements, and tax returns to show what kind of monthly payment they can afford. It's that same information um, in a short sale, but what we're trying to do is explain to the mortgage companies why this homeowner can't afford their mortgage anymore. They've lost their job. They don't have income. They can't afford it. And then they'll also, the lender will also do an appraisal on the property to determine value and then negotiate. So we oversee that middle part to get to an approval letter to allow for settlement. Okay. Um, and really what will, as part of that is we educate the homeowner. All right. Um, we pull title on every one of our transactions, any other liens or judgments, second mortgages, HOA, condo association liens, we'll do all of that. Okay. And the goal here is to get um, the homeowner out of a bad situation, get the you as a listing agent and a buyer's agent paid full commission. All right. And get the short sale approved in a shorter time period versus a realtor trying to do it on their own or a title company. Because <clears throat> as I said earlier, we've been doing this 20 years, but this is all that we do. So it truly is a specialty. Okay. Um, but um, reason I wanted to, and we've talked about this before um, at a higher level, but we want to spend a little bit of time and Denise jump in here when, when you, when you, uh, if, if needed, but um, for the purposes of those that aren't aware of the, of the CARES Act, um, CARES Act was put into play March, 2020, and it was when the pandemic first hit. And what we're seeing now is folks that have exited out of that program and they're still struggling financially and they're putting their homes on the market. And it's causing some confusion because the lenders are taking um, that payment holiday amount, which we'll explain in a minute, and they're either putting it on the back end as a balloon payment or they're putting second mortgages on the property. The confusion is, is that the homeowner doesn't think it's important to tell their listing agent that they were in forbearance. They're giving their listing agent bad intel. They're saying, oh, my mortgage statement says I owe X but they really don't owe X, they owe X plus $40,000, all right? So it's our phone is ringing now two to three times a month from title companies, attorneys, and realtors that are calling us saying, I'm two weeks from settlement, they did a uh, final title bring down, I'm two weeks from settlement, they got an updated payoff and the numbers are skewed and we can't go to settlement because we're upside down in the mortgage. So CARES Act, um, when it was put into play in March 2020, um, it provided two protections to homeowners. One was a moratorium on any new foreclosure filing for any homeowner that was current on their mortgage prior to March 2020. So what we've seen now for a two-year period, which ended August of 2021, but for two years, there was really no foreclosure activity from Bank of America, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Mr. Cooper, which, which used to be Nation Star Mortgage. So you have right now what we're seeing is we're seeing a backlog in foreclosure filings. OK, um, but the lenders are slowly but surely starting to turn those on. That's good news for all of us because we are going to have more inventory out there and it's going to become available. Um, the second thing, which is what we're going to spend most of the time on here um, for the next couple of slides, is the right to mortgage forbearance. So when the pandemic first hit March 2020, when the lockdown went in place, the Fed went to all the lenders and said, hey, we bailed you out back in 2006, 7 and 8. We need you to help us help struggling homeowners. So the Fed mandated to the mortgage companies said, if any of your borrowers with a federally backed loan, that's Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, USDA, if any borrower calls you and tells you that they're impacted due to COVID, you have to give them a minimum of six months of payment holiday. 
that six months, all right, was extended up to 12 months and eventually was extended up to 18 months of payment holiday. Now, the application deadline for this program expired August 2021. So reality is right now today, there are still 2 million homeowners that are actively in forbearance that won't exit out into February, March of next year. March of 2020, April, May of 2020, there were 5 million homeowners that were in this program, okay? So, and, and, and think about what was happening, you know, back in March, 2020, businesses were shut down, you couldn't travel, you know, outside the continental United States, you were locked in um, and, and, and you had businesses that were closing down as a result of it. And then you had folks that work for those businesses that were, you know, unfortunately um, impacted financially. So the reason that we're spending time on this is that whenever we teach continuing ed and whenever we go into like a lunch and learn at a different brokerage, um, you know, we always ask who's familiar with mortgage uh, with the CARES Act and no offense to any realtors, majority of folks don't know. They don't raise their hand. They don't know what CARES Act is. So Denise and I, as a result of this, really said, hey, look, we got to really spend some time and educate realtors. Um, Denise and I last month, um, we had um, four sessions with a Keller Williams group down in Southern Florida, Miami, Lauderdale, there, there was a group of four offices. And in like three and a half, three days, we did four training sessions and multiple agents attended each one. Not one agent could explain what the CARES Act was. So that's why we're spending time on it. But here's how it worked, okay? If I had a federally back loan and let's say I was downsized, you know, I was furloughed during COVID, all I had to do was pick up the phone call Bank of America, call Wells Fargo and say, hey, this is Bill McCormick. I have one of your loans. You're servicing my loan. And I, I've lost my job or I've been downsized. And at a minimum, Bank of America had to put me into a six month program of payment holiday. OK, now what they do is they take that six months at the end of the six month term. If I'm fine, I'm able to make my payments again. All right. They take that six month of payments. And if I have a conventional mortgage, they put a balloon. They defer it to the back end of my loan. OK, if my loan was conventional, what we're seeing is the lenders are putting what's called a partial claim, which looks like a second mortgage. OK, so but let's use the example of a homeowner that was in 18 month of forbearance at $2,800 a month. So month 19, here's what happens. Month 19, the homeowner starts making their monthly payment, but the lender says, okay, you maxed out your forbearance, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna balloon $53,200. We're gonna defer that to the back end of your mortgage. So when you sell your property, when you refinance, or at the end of your original mortgage term, at that time, you have to pay that balloon, okay? Here's where the confusion comes in. Homeowner gets a mortgage statement. What we're realizing is the big three, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, their mortgage statements have not been updated or modified to show any information on the forbearance amount. So the homeowner is looking at their mortgage statement. We're in the trust business, right? We trust people. Homeowner says, I owe $180,000, all right? That's what my mortgage statement says. The listing agent goes and lists it and says, well, good news. I can sell it for 230. After we pay your closing fees, you walk away with 20 grand. Here's the challenge. They don't owe 180. They didn't include that $53,000 on top of it because they didn't think it was important to tell you that they were in forbearance. So actually their payoff is 230, the same price you're listing it at. And this is being discovered about a week and a half, 10 days before settlement because the title company, the attorneys aren't getting final payoffs until a couple of weeks before settlement, okay? The second thing 
that we're seeing. And this is primarily on FHA mortgages, okay? They're putting what's called a partial claim, all right? And, and the only way you can find that is if you pull a title search, all right? Because guess what? If my loan, my first mortgage was with Bank of America, I get a monthly statement every month from Bank of America. If I have an FHA loan, I just call Bank of America and I get them to give me a payoff. But if I have a partial claim, partial claims on FHA loans, they're actually overseen by Housing Urban Development. You actually have to call Housing Urban Development and get the payoff for that partial claim, which acts like a second mortgage. Denise, you want to spend a couple seconds around that? Mm -hmm. So why it's not showing anywhere, as Bill said, because you don't have to make the monthly payments, it's it's put on as a second. So Bill and I, and there's a servicing company for housing and urban development for these partial claims, and it's called ISN. They're just the servicer for this. So many of our agents are going to settlement and the seller's thinking they're walking away with X amount of money. And then the um, escrow is calling and saying, do you know that there's a second and there's a balance of, let's use Bill's example, of 53,200 due on this. And the seller says, I never had a second mortgage. Well, did you ever do a modification? Did you participate in the CARES Act? Oh, well, absolutely. Well, a lot of these clients thought that this money was free money and they didn't understand when the forbearance ended and there had to be something figured out with the 53-2, they signed whatever they needed to sign to be able to save their home. And then they're going to sell maybe a year later. And this applied to people that did modifications years ago as well. So these partial claims have been around a long time. Bill and I aren't seeing quite so many of them related to the CARES Act which we're expecting we're going to see in the next you know, year or so when these people are ready to sell their house. But you will see them on somebody that is ready to sell that did a modification eight, 10 years ago on an FHA loan. And that mod money was put into a second service by this ISN, but no payments were ever required. It's just called due at the time of settlement. They actually get paid prior to, let's say the bank is Bank of America. So Bank of America holds the note and then the seller goes into this forbearance program and has this partial claim for the 53-2. They're not gonna get any payments on this, but that, that 53-2 is going to get paid because this is a government program in front of the B of A, even though B of A is recorded in position ahead of this partial claim. But that was an agreement that the government had with the B of A, the Wells Fargo, et cetera. So the Bank of America, it's not an issue. They understand that the partial claim gets paid first. But what we always suggest, which Bill's gonna go from all these sessions we were teaching um, to make this all easier for the agents, this bill created this flow sheet so that which will be the next slide that he'll go over with you and, and what you need to ask the bank so you can determine whether or not this individual has this if they participated. The highlight has to be you're not going to call the bank and say, is there a second mortgage put on this property? Because they're going to say, no, there was no 80-20 done. There is no second mortgage on this. You've got to use the, use the words partial claim. So at the suggestion of somebody, Bill, Bill worked with this person, put this flow sheet together, and I love it. So Chad, that, that's brand new from the last time we spoke. Agents are copying it and carrying it in our area. I think what, Bill, three or four states are changing our sellers' disclosures, and they it's going through legal. It's been taking a lot of time. It's going to be three or four months, but these questions are going to be incorporated into a newly um, amended seller's disclosure because of all these issues that are arising. So I'm not sure if that's there's any intention of that to be done in Hawaii, but um, well, one if thing not, this one thing that I'll, sheet is great. One thing that I'll say real quick too is um, we are adding a um, 
uh, a document for our listings that are going to is going to be required. So it'll be a document for sellers to complete just asking some of these questions. And that came from our last mastermind too. So while I don't know if the state is going to adopt that that change, but we internally with KW will be. So we're a little bit ahead of it. Thanks to you guys. Yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. And maybe you might want to, once you see that flow chart, Chad, from what Bill has just changed it, it makes it pretty simple to, for your document. It's, it's great. So Bill, do you want to go over that? I, I love yeah. that chart. Just, just understand that, that homeowners, when they entered into these programs, you know, the, the sky was falling, right? We were at the start of a pandemic. We were in the middle of a pandemic folks are willing to do whatever they had to do to try and save their home. But because the program was rolled out so quickly by the Fed, there was no mandate on what happens after the fact. Even now, if you go on Bank of America, Wells Fargo's website, for an example, you're not going to see anything that says, oh, if you're in forbearance, here are your options. And really, the way the program was rolled out, it's the first program of its kind ever that, that provided mortgage relief to a homeowner and the homeowner ha didn't have to provide any proof of income. All they had to do was call their lender, okay? So what we're, what we're doing is, and, and this is a flow chart that we created after we got some feedback at different training sessions is, all right, what can we do? What can we do as a realtor if I'm listing a property and I'm disclosing the MLS to protect myself and protect my homeowner? And, and here's a real example. So before this, this, this flow chart was created, I was te teaching a continuing ed class and I was going over you know, the high level of the CARES Act. And we got on a whole conversation of what can you ask, what can't you ask? And I said, well, you know, asking the group that was in, in the continuing ed, you know, when you meet with a homeowner to list a property, you're asking how much do you owe? Who's on the mortgage? You know, are there any other mortgages on the property? Um, you know, if you live in a condo HOA, are you current on that? You're asking questions anyway. Why not ask questions if somebody participated in the CARES Act? Don't assume that that homeowner thinks it's important to tell you. And before I get into the flow chart, so I'm, I'm teaching the continuing ed and a realtor, she raises her hand and she said, um, you know, this is very timely. I'm, I'm actually in the middle of a settlement. Um, and a potential lawsuit resulting from this very same thing. And it wasn't resolved yet, but he, here's what she told the class. She said, um, I was about 10 days out from settlement. The title company calls me and says, hey, we have a problem. There's a second mortgage on the property. And um, based on the sales price and your closing fees, you're about 40 grand short. Okay. So the agent then calls her listing client and said, hey, Sue homeowner, are you aware of a second mortgage on your property for roughly 50,000? And she said, well, no, but I was in 18 month mortgage forbearance. Do you think that had anything to do with it? Okay. So the realtor went on to tell the class, here's my situation now. Two weeks ago, I was supposed to settle. We didn't settle. OK, I got the buyer's agent who I know this is her explaining buyer's agent. I know buyer's agent wasn't happy, but was trying to work through a solution. Buyer's broker was now calling her broker threatening legal action because they had already spent money on appraisals. They spent money on inspections. She said, thank God they hadn't moved out of their house yet because all their stuff would have been on a more moving van. And they would have um, had already, they had sold their house, but they hadn't yet moved out of it. So she said, now I got the buyer's broker telling my broker, the buyers are going to sue. They don't care. All right. The homeowner has to come up with the money or they're going to sue. So she said, had I known to ask questions, I could have put in the MLS, the proper disclosure that said, hey, there's not enough based on current market value to pay the loan in full. And then we have to make this a short sale. At the end of the day, her homeowner, who thought she was walking away with money, had to actually go take out a personal loan for 50 grand to make up the shortfall amount so she didn't have to sue. So because of that, all right, just get in the habit of asking a question, you know, on a listing appointment out of curiosity, 
Did you, were you in the, uh, during COVID, did you take advantage of the CARES Act mortgage forbearance program? If the homeowner says, no, I wasn't uh, part of the program, then you just move on, okay? And just a little kind of, uh, kind of uh, hint that with the homeowners, um, it, it, it had to be um, your principal residence, all right? You had to occupy the home. So if it wasn't a full-time residence, it wouldn't qualify for CARES Act anyway, okay? But let's say the homeowner says, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm glad you asked that. I was in forbearance. Next question is, were you in the six, 12, or 18 months forbearance? Oh, I was in the 12 month payment holiday program. Then the next response from the realtor should be, okay, what did you and your mortgage company agree to regarding those 18 months of payments? Did they defer it to the back end of your mortgage as a balloon? Or did they put a second mortgage called partial claim on your home? If the seller says, oh, um, the lender deferred that amount, all right? Yeah, they put a balloon, all right? At that point in time, don't go by the mortgage statement, all right? If they deferred it to the back end, all you need to do is have a, the homeowner request a full payoff from their mortgage lender. Don't go by the mortgage statement because the mortgage statement isn't an accurate reflection. And as I said earlier, we are not seeing any ref reference to the um, uh, to the forbearance payments on a mortgage statement. So if it was deferred, all you need to do is a full payoff, okay? If the seller says, you know what? I think they put a partial claim on the property. At that point, what you wanna do is you wanna run a mortgage and judgment search. You don't need a full title search. You only wanna check mortgage and judgments against those individuals that are currently um, that currently own the home. You don't need the whole history, okay? If you run the title search, all right, the, part, the, the present, we locally we call it a present owner search. It's not a full search. But if you run the search and you see, oh, yes, you'll see a what looks like a second mortgage. It'll say housing or Department of Housing Urban Development. At that point in time, then you need to know, you need to go contact either NOVAD Consulting or the ISN they are the two different types of uh, two different billing companies for housing urban development. But if you don't know to ask, you know, were you in or was it deferred or was there a partial claim that you don't really know where to go? OK, and if you do the partial search and you see that it is a judgment, then you have to or sorry that it is a partial claim, then, you know, you need to go get the full payoff. And what Denise said earlier on a settlement statement you know, first mortgage is Bank of America, but what gets paid off first is that partial claim. We're only seeing the partial claims on FHA originated loans, all right? Every other mortgage, conventional VA, USDA, for the most part, we're seeing that payment deferred, okay? Now, if the homeowner says, you know what? I was in the program, but I'm not really sure what I signed up for at the end, okay? You can either coach the homeowner to call their lender and say, look, I was in mortgage forbearance last year. What did you do with my with my my payment holiday? That 52 grand of payments that I didn't have to pay for 18 months. All right. And then that at that, if you can coach them and they can ask the lender that question, that way you'll know whether you just need a payoff or whether you need a partial uh, a, a present owner search and a payoff from housing urban development for that. If your homeowner's not comfortable asking that, or you don't have faith in their ability to do that, maybe they're not financially savvy, maybe they're a little shy, you can actually get authorized with the home by the homeowner and you can actually contact a lender on their behalf and ask those questions, okay? It's just a simple two, three questions just to really protect yourself because you wanna make sure what you're disclosing in the MLS is accurate based on the information the homeowner gave you. And this way you can help root out and make that homeowner think. And here's the challenge. The partial claim, the partial claim takes 18 monthly payments or 12 monthly payments or six monthly payments. Those monthly payments include principal, interest, 
and taxes, okay? But guess what? Because it's a zero interest loan, because it already includes interest in it, to be paid at time of sale, refinance, or end of term, guess what? Housing Urban Development and ISN, they never send a, mor a mortgage statement. A year, two years, three years, five years down the road, when this homeowner decides they want to go sell, they're going to totally forget about it, okay? Because it's a zero interest loan. HUD never knows to, doesn't have to ever send a mortgage statement, all right? So the homeowner, it's out of sight, out of mind. So just protect yourself, ask those questions, all right? Any questions on that before we move on? But I, I will tell you, folks, we are seeing this more and more, more and more. Um, okay, let's change gears. Let's talk about what we're seeing right now. And, you know, I, I just saw a couple months ago, I believe, Hawaii just surpassed California as the um, highest average sales price um, in, the, in the entire country. So, you know, again, now, you know, we're seeing a shift now and California always used to be the highest. Now we're seeing, you know, the Hawaii market um, surpassing that. But in every market, every market right now, um, we are seeing an increase in foreclosures because think about it, for two years, foreclosures were turned off. So we have clients right now have not paid a mortgage that we're doing short sales for, haven't paid a mortgage in four and five years because they were, they were um, delinquent before the lenders decided to stop foreclosure, were told to stop foreclosure during the pandemic, and now they're getting caught back up. So I said earlier, we were just down with the Keller Williams Group down in Hawaii, and, or Hawaii, sorry, down in Florida, Miami is is like the crypto capital now of 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 the United of the United States. All these crypto companies from New York and all over are going down Miami. The skyline of Miami now looks like New York City. All right, guess what? Miami Dade has the highest foreclosure rate in the entire state of Florida. You got all this money coming in, but you have people that you know, average folks that make average money that are struggling due to inflation and everything else that's going on right now. So let's talk about the Hawaii opportunity, okay? We use RealtyTrack. RealtyTrack um, is part of a company called Adam Data, A-T-T-O-M. They track all foreclosure activity, um, literally all across the country, down to the county level, down to the zip code level. So what I'd like to do is just kind of spend a few minutes, give you a flavor on where we are right now um, in the Hawaii market, okay? So overall, right, there's about 854 foreclosures um, in Hawaii. Doesn't sound like a lot, but what we're seeing is those numbers are starting to, to pick back up now and will continue on. But basically how that's broken down is let's look at the Honolulu, Honolulu County specifically, all right? Right now, there's about 525 active foreclosures, okay? But if you look at the bullet point down, 453 of them are pre-foreclosures, okay? Pre-foreclosure simply means that the homeowner paid outside of their grace period or they missed a payment or multiple payments. These are folks that are in default of their mortgage. Pre-foreclosures become foreclosures, where then it gets into the court system, and then the lenders have to take it through the foreclosure process in order to hold a sheriff sale to repossess the property. So right now, Honolulu County, we're looking at about 525 active foreclosure properties, okay? Um, in, in Hawaii County, um, we have about 148 of those 111 are pre-foreclosure, which means they're headed for that, that, um, that legal action um, to take the property back. I did Maui. Maui right now has about 132 um, foreclosures. And again, you also see on that list, bank owned. Those are ones that are taken back at, at, a, at a sheriff's sale. 
and then ones that are scheduled for auction. And then lastly, I did Kauai. Um, right now there's 49 um, uh, active foreclosures. So in just those few counties, you're looking at about close to 900 foreclosures, all right? Those are potentially 900, pe 900 homeowners that need your help, okay? And one of the things that I, I, I've done this a little bit more in breakout sessions, but I'm just going to spend a couple minutes on this. Finding foreclosure listings is not hard, all right? It does take a little bit of time and effort, but guess what? Once a foreclosure has started, and how a foreclosure starts is, let's say Denise is two months delinquent, all right, and I'm Bank of America. I'll give Denise about five to six months of missed payments before I hire a local attorney to go into the local court and file a civil civil filing known as a list pendants. Once, once five, six months passed, I've exhausted my collection activity. Um, you know, my I'm, I'm sent her letters. Hey, we're going to we're going to initiate foreclosure action. And Denise didn't have the ability to bring a current. At some point, I'm going to say, you know what? I need to initiate foreclosure in order to um, uh, get my property back, get the asset back for a non-performing loan. Now, Hawaii is a little unique because it has non-judicial and judicial. Um, but again, most times what we're seeing now is more judicial than anything. But um, there's a great resource. You can go on the e-court system and you can do a party search, okay? And what I mean by party search is that you're not gonna be able to put in Joe or Sue homeowner's name unless you meet with Joe or Sue homeowner and they say, oh, I'm delinquent. Then you can go plug in their name and see if they're actively in foreclosure. But you can do a search by business. Um, you can do Wells, Wells Fargo. You can do JP Morgan Chase, okay? You can plug in bank. Bank will cover a lot of things, all right? Bank of Hawaii, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America. But from there, okay, you get a drop down list of, of the, the mortgage company and the party, the homeowner, okay, that you can try and identify. So it's pretty easy to do this search. I mean, basically, you go into the court system, you, you click in the case type, you want to do CV, Circuit Civil Court, and you want to plug in your filing date. Let's go for the last 30 to 45 days. I always say check for a partial search. There's a little box you click there. That way, if you have JP Morgan or Morgan, it'll pick up those lenders. But if you look down into the box at the bottom, all right, it has the party name. The first one there says Bank of America. It has the case, all right, and it has a little blue underline. It has three CCV-22, and it says specialized loan servicing against D. Piesco, admin of Peter Visser's estate. You could actually click on that little blue box, and then it'll give you the docket information, okay? Here's another example where I just typed in Wells Fargo. I did a partial search. And then here for that time period, it's gonna tell me all the um, individuals that Wells Fargo, and it also has Bank of America in here, all right, that are actually foreclosing. So you can identify individual names that are being foreclosed on. You're gonna to have to do a little bit more research to find the property address, okay? Um, but in essence, that gives you a report that looks like this that you can click through, okay? Now, let me back up a second. Once you do that click through in that, that blue button, okay? It'll click through and it'll give you um, information. You wanna look for docket or documents, okay? And there's a list of, of documents and dates in there. And that actually shows like a little, like little blank PDF, um, almost a transparent PDF. You can actually, if you see where it has civil complaint or list pendants, you click on that, okay? It'll actually give you the person's address, okay? Um, the date they were served papers and all that. 
There is a fee through eCourt to get that document. However, you can also, via other public records, maybe in your MLS, do searches on those individuals with their names to locate their address. Because really all you're looking to do is identify someone that's in distress and then you can market accordingly, okay? But it is a pay for. So you can click through this, this CVV button right here that I'm circling right now, and then it'll take you to a, another screen and it has several options. You click on the docket and then it does a drop down of all the documents. So again, you may have to pay a little bit money to get that, or you can do some other, other public search to find that. But the information's there. It's not hard to find. Um, people ask all the time, hey, I, I buy lists, you know, and, it, you know, well, the reality is other people are buying those foreclosure lists as well. Most times they're, they're dated. All right. If you monitor this every couple of weeks, all right, you can really stay on top of it and stay ahead of it. OK, but it's not hard to find folks that are distressed. All right. Here's and I, I think I, I brought this up before. If you're not speaking with housing counselors, all right, there's a free resource. These folks should be added to your sphere of influence. Divorce attorneys, bankruptcy attorneys, estate attorneys are all resources for you for folks that are struggling financially, getting divorced, somebody died, right? Because at some point, if there's no value, those events trigger most times a property sale. Guess what? If I have a, an FHA loan and I'm struggling, all right, and I'm looking to do a loan modification or a refinance, all right, I have to go work with a housing counselor. Guess what? That housing counselor will review all my financials to help me determine, can I save my home? That housing counselor is also speaking with my bank if or my mortgage company to assist me um, to do a loan modification. And if that housing counselor exhausts all the resources and says, hey, Bill, we reviewed everything. You don't have the ability to save, it, save this home. You need to put this house on the market to avoid foreclosure. Guess what? The next thing the homeowner is going to have to do is figure out, all right, well, who do I list my property with? Housing counselors, because they are a government resource, can't say, um, go work with Chad, go work with Maria. What they can say is, hey, I have several realtors that I know are experienced in distressed property owners foreclosures. Here's their name. You can go interview them. So get on these folks' radars, introduce yourselves, and particularly like where you, where you all are, you have a big veterans presence. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, folks that are, that are in the service military, they get transferred from place to place. And a lot of times, you know, the, 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 the military is supposed to help these folks and the mortgage companies are supposed to work with these folks. But what we see is, Hey, if you're an FHA borrower and you only put 4% down and you bought it, you know, two years ago when the market was crazy or a year ago when the market was crazy, now you're being, um, you know, you're moved to another state, not our problem. All right. So there's a lot of veterans you can help with this too. Okay. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the short sale as an alternative to foreclosure. All right. Understand that folks, before they get to you on the listing side, odds are they're going to have explored a refinance. Maybe they explored a loan modification. Maybe they explored what's called, what's called a deed in lieu where they hand the deed over, okay? Um, and then they've exhausted those resources before they come to you. Majority of the folks that Denise and I work with, they're already several months behind, if not years behind on their mortgage, okay? And think about this, all right? If I'm behind in my mortgage, all right? And, you know, I've got equity that's gone like this over the last two years. The easiest thing for me to do is to go and refinance my mortgage. That's always option number one. Can I refinance my property to make my payments more affordable? Here's one of the challenges we're seeing. 
all right? Two years ago, you can get a 375 rate. Today, 675 to a little over seven. Refinancing is off the table right now. So that is the number one thing folks do when they're struggling to afford their mortgage is they refinance to try and lower their payment. That option's gone. So we have folks right now, all right, that don't have the ability to refinance, even though they have equity, they can't refinance. So guess what? Just because someone's distressed, they can't afford their mortgage anymore, does not mean they're a short sale. They can still sell and walk away with money. As the market normalizes and the values go from this to this and then starting to go down. And I think, I, I know in most of our markets, we're starting to see prices softening up and we're seeing quote unquote price improvements, uh, which are also known as price reductions. But if someone is upside down the mortgage, they owe more than the value and they can't afford it anymore, all right? That is by definition a short sale. They are short of a full payoff. There's not enough value in the home given its condition and, and market comps to pay off the debt in full plus pay all the closing fees. Because of that, because of that, you have to take an offer, a contract between buyer and seller, and you have to present it to the mortgage company, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, et cetera, and say, hey, look, Bank of America, um, Joe can't afford his property anymore and he owes 300, but they're only selling for $250,000 right now. Would you accept $250,000 right now and allow Joe to walk away, approve taking less than what's owed? Guess what? Mortgage companies do that all the time because they don't want to foreclose. Mortgage companies don't want to be property owners, okay? So because of that, you need to present the offer to the lender. Dan, you want to talk about benefits a little bit? So the benefits of a short sale will be, you know, why would somebody say, hey, I'm just going to let this property, you know, foreclose. They don't want to do that. They want to do the short sale because they're going to be able to buy a home far sooner than if they were foreclosed upon. But also, Bill usually uses the term, it's your get out of jail free um, card is the benefit of a short sale because on that approval letter that the bank issues once the entire short sale process is completed, it's going to say on there that this debt is settled as agreed. The bank is never going to come after you again. It's laid out, it's written out, and it's in the letter versus if somebody's foreclosed upon, you have no idea what the primary lien holder, the second lien holder, what any other judgments on title are going to do and or come after that person. So in this letter, the lender on a short sale will report the debt settled as agreed for less than the full balance owed. The only time we don't really see that is if someone's loan is with a credit union and or a small local bank. It's not as easy for those smaller banks to write a debt off. So you have to be real careful on their approval letters because they might do what's called just a lien release only. They're only going to release the lien against the property to allow the sale to move forward. But 90% of the banks out there issue in this letter that they will never ever come after you and they're going to waive all future collection activity. You're forgiven of everything. And the reason being on the credit unions and the small local banks is if they have um, bad debt on their books, it's then going to impact their borrowing and then impact their lending where on the B of A's, the Wells Fargo's, they just write that, they just write that off and forgive you of the balance owed on it. But that's a huge benefit on a short sale because it, it's clearly written out that nobody's going to come and see you, come after you again. Well, years later, a lot of times it can be two or three years later down the line, we'll get a call from somebody 
who we did their short sale, they're ready to buy a new home and they're going to say, oh my gosh, you know, my new lender just said that I had a foreclosure. Can you tell them that I didn't have a foreclosure? Did you save the approval letter? No, I can't find it. So we always have them on file. So we share that and say, no, you, you weren't foreclosed upon. Here's the short sale. And here's a copy of your settlement sheet that shows that you you know, Mary Smith, were the seller, not Bank of America, not Chase. If you were foreclosed upon, the bank would show as the seller on the settlement sheet. So it's easy to prove later down the line because they have the short sale approval letter and you have the settlement sheet that shows this property was not foreclosed upon. And that definitely affects the individual being able to purchase far sooner than if they were foreclosed upon. Typically three years Somebody that does a short sale, we've seen go back out and buy another home again. Yeah, and 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 the approval letter serves as a payoff. So, you know, when the lender does all their due diligence and they review the offer and they um, do their appraisal and they agree upon the price, that approval letter goes to the homeowner. The approval letter gets delivered to the buyer's title company and the buyer's um, uh, mortgage lender if they're getting a mortgage because most mortgage folks won't complete underwriting until they see the short sales approved. The title company can't be guaranteed that title will be clear until they see that approval letter, okay? But it, it is a, a seller document that goes right to the seller. The other thing is, and, and I didn't add this to the slide, um, is if, if a mortgage company forgives someone of debt, $50,000 for an example, well, the other thing that's listed in approval letter is by law, right? Bank of America, we will we, we re report your forgiven debt as settled, but we have to issue you a 1099C for $50,000 and inform the IRS that we forgave you of debt, right? That's the law. Forget, it's debits and credits, right? If I, as Bank of America, have a $50,000 write off on a debt obligation, Uncle Sam says, okay. You got the benefit of the write-off. Who got the benefit of, of, the, of the forgiven debt? Homeowner. Congratulations, homeowner. You have to pay income tax. Now, Congress um, reinstituted what's called the Mortgage Debt Services Relief Act at the end of 2020. Um, and it had gone away for, for a few years. But basically, it only applies to primary residences, not second homes, not investment properties. So if someone resides full-time, has to be two and a half of the last five years, how they prove that is what address is on their tax return, okay? But the Mortgage Debt Services Relief Act is if someone gets forgiven of debt in a foreclosure or a short sale, okay? Um, here, here, here are the ground rules. If it's just one person on the mortgage, okay, I don't have to pay any income tax up to $375,000 in forgiven debt, all right? That's the Mortgage Debt Services Relief Act. If Denise and I as a couple are both on the mortgage, we don't have to pay any income tax up to $750,000 in forgiven debt, okay? That's not sales price, folks, all right? So as market prices normalize, and potentially it will go down as, as interest rates you know, are up where they are, you know, demand goes down and, and then all of a sudden property values go down. Well, you may have a situation where a homeowner, you know, let's say in the last two years, they overpaid by, by 150 grand to be competitive. And then the market value drops by hundred grand in six months or a year, okay? Well, all of a sudden they're looking at a pretty sizable tax bill if they had to sell it short, okay? Don't give tax advice, but if you are working with a homeowner and they are upside down and it's their primary residence, direct them to talk to their accountant to make sure they qualify for the Mortgage Debt Services Relief Act. This went into play back in 2007 and had gone away in 2017. Congress came out in 2020, renewed, renewed it retroactive for three years and extended it through 2025. National Association of Realtors lobbied very hard to get this back in 
And at the end of December, um, Congress renewed it for a five-year window, okay? So that's a huge, huge benefit for folks. Um, now, in order to qualify for a short sale, it's not difficult to figure out, all right? Are you upside down the mortgage? And do you have financial hardship? Meaning I can't make my mortgage payment. The most common reasons, number one is job loss. I've lost my job, all right? I don't have income. I can't afford to pay my bills. Therefore, I've fallen behind, all right? Uh, another reason, divorce, dual income, together they they qualify for a mortgage independently when they split up they can no longer afford that 35 percent of our short sales are divorces unfortunately um, another reason is death somebody passes away all right you know husband and wife spouse passes away they don't have that income coming in anymore death is considered a legitimate hardship and then the other four, fourth most common is medical illness you have somebody a family member, that has an extended illness, you know, you got mounting medical bills, all right, I will guarantee you that if you have a sick family member, you're going to opt to pay the mortgage, uh, pay the uh, insurance company and the hospital bills um, before the mortgage, if it means life or death for, for your family member. So those are the most common things. So people get at, or we get asked all the time, well, hey, how does this person qualify for a short sale? Do they owe more than the value? And is there financial distress? Those two things will qualify you for a short sale, right? Denise, you want to cover? Yep. yep. So a, a few important things related to some tips on short sale is if you're at a listing agent, and you're, well, if we're facilitating it, first of all, if you are going out on a listing and determine that somebody's upside down, if our company is handling it, we want to be called immediately because we right away are going to get third party authorization from the seller. We're going to order payoffs. We're going to get a search. We're going to determine if there's a, how many liens, additional liens that the homeowner was or the borrower was not aware of any additional judgments on title. If for some reason you're trying to determine and you don't know if it's a short sale, you wanna get authorized right away with the mortgage company. Your seller, you could call the bank while you're at their property. Call in, ask for a payoff to be faxed directly to you. And that borrower can give permission for you to be able to talk on the loan so you can order the payoffs immediately. But you want to make sure you're in control of the situation with the bank. So definitely get authorized because a lot of sellers think they can just call in and get a verbal and the verbal numbers are definitely not accurate. You need to see the mortgage payoff in writing. Just call the bank and say we're closing next month. Um, and, um, you know, can you give me a payoff a month out? So then once you're authorized, you, are, you order that full payoff. Um, if you are listing a property and you have determined and you know that it's a short sale, you have to make sure you're disclosing the proper language in the MLS. And what I mean by that is a lot of people that if they vacated a property, moved out because they weren't making the payments and the water's off, the electric's off, you've got to disclose out there who is going to be responsible for getting that turned back on for an inspection, for an appraisal for the buyer's financing. We get calls all the time on short sales. The electric's off, the water's off, we need to do our appraisal, the buy side for the financing. How do we get it back on? Well, you, you can't get it back on as far as the sell side goes because the sell side's delinquent on it and the bank is not gonna turn it on for them unless they pay the bill. And that bill follows the seller for electric most times, so they're not, they're not going to pay it. So please make sure you disclose in the MLS who's responsible for getting that on. Typically, you can just reach out to the electric companies and get a one-day pass. So most of them are pretty good with that to um, allow the appraisal to be done. As far as determining a value for a property, um, the, the bank has changed slightly on this. They want a CMA done. They want you to go out and determine if this was not a short sale. The house is worth 300000 based on the condition. If there were repairs needed, a new roof, et cetera, then you're going to price it based on 
the comps, less any you know, major defects or repairs. So let's say that number's 300. The bank wants to see the property listed at or slightly above that number that you come up with. So listed 305, listed 310. You keep it on the market about a week. After seven days, if all of the feedback is it's overpriced, it's overpriced, the bank wants to see a small three to 5% price reduction. They don't want to see you keeping on a property on the market for close to what somebody owes for a month, even with all the feedback saying it's overpriced. They want to now see, this is a big change, Chad, since our for our short sales back in the day, three to 5% price reductions every seven to 14 days is the general rule of thumb based on the feedback that you are getting from the agents who are viewing the property. They don't want it to see it sitting out there and then a $50,000 offer come in, 50,000 below what your list is a month later and you try and justify to the bank by saying, yeah, but I had it on the market for a month and I got nothing. Well, what about in between the 250 and the 300? So it carries a lot of weight if based on the feedback you do those small reduction. Um, Bill covered why we want a title search ordered, um, and you can just search the present owner. Uh, here's an example. Maria, I'll bring up our deal, it, and I don't even know. We just kind of handle this behind the scenes, which is why we're involved. We don't want to alarm everybody. We're brought in, and, and we just deal with it. For those of you that we've worked with in the past, Maria, I, I saw you online, so I'm, I'm referencing you. Um, the title came, the search came in and at the beginning of the process, there's a first mortgage and there's a second mortgage on title. Yep. We saw the two mortgages. The seller said, oh, I had an HOA lien, but the HOA lien has been paid off. Um, and I don't have any other liens or judgments. Well, when, um, the initial prelim title came in, like I said, it showed the two mortgages. That was great. No big deal there. But the HOA lien that she had paid off four or five years ago um, was still showing. It had never been satisfied. So we, so that there's not any, you know, hurdles right before settlement, we're taking care of that now. So now we can get that sat. Now we can get that off to escrow to get this recorded. Now that's all resolved. So when escrow comes to you two weeks before settlement and says, did you know there's an HOA lien? My seller paid it. Well, you got to go get it satisfied. So title always shows something different than what a seller many times thinks. This seller had no idea that she had a lien from the state of Hawaii for taxes that she hadn't paid years ago. After we navigated through the state to determine which taxes were delinquent, it was determined. They also did the same thing. The seller paid it off but no SAP was ever recorded. So if you get a title up front and or we reach out and get the title for facilitating, we're ironing everything out as we're doing the short sale process to allow for a smooth closing. But if you're doing that search on your own, you don't want any surprises at the end um, or short sale on your own, you wanna make sure you get a search. It's really important. If you have somebody that reaches out to you and says, I urgently need to get my property on the market in the next two weeks because I'm scheduled for a sheriff sale, you need to get on the phone with the bank and say, is there any shot this sheriff sale can be postponed? Because the Fannie Mae's, Freddie Mac's, they require an offer 37 days prior to a scheduled sheriff sale. They'll typically stop a sheriff sale maybe one time, but they're not going to do it a second time or a third time. So if somebody has a sense of urgency for you to list, number one, ask them why, get to the bottom of that. And number two, you've got to get on the phone with the bank because I can 100% assure you that if it is a Freddie Mac back deal, you could fight as hard as hard as can be. You can reach out to the sheriff's office. You can reach out to the foreclosing attorneys and that sale will not be stopped. So if you list, get an offer, you're wasting your time, energy, marketing dollars for that person that has had the last nine months to pull their head out um, of the sand that they dug it into because the bank has no patience unless it's 37 days prior to. We get asked the question all the time, where did the 37 days come from? We have no idea.
nobody's ever shared, nobody knows. There's no reason even the banks don't know, but it is 37 days. Um, and rocks being changed on a property does not mean that the bank um, now owns the property. In our area, obviously, we're in 20 degree weather here now. So it's a huge issue on the East Coast where the banks are changing the locks because they have to winterize the property. They have to protect their asset. They've got to drain the pipes and they've got to make sure the pipes don't freeze when the temps drop. In your area, it's about getting making sure the AC is on and there's no mold growing. So the banks do change the locks to protect their asset and send in a property preservation company to make sure the property is being maintained. But until the property goes to sheriff sale, that homeowner owns that property. Do not be nervous of change the locks. We can get a key from the bank and or the seller has every right to change those locks back. Did you have anything to add on that? Oh, and there's a couple banks, uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase will not allow electronic signatures. The bulk of them um, allow electronics, but um, the three of them won't. Uh, what does Maria say? Going down the, sorry. You have something to add, Maria? I literally wrote a documentary on the chat. <laughs> no, I wanted to add um, to everyone that normally when I see that a seller were going down that short sale lane, I immediately called Denise because we one time, I don't know if you remember this, Denise, had a listing presentation with someone that thought he could short mm -hmm. sale the property. And because I brought her in right away, she let me know, hey, Maria, this person cannot short sale because he's already way down the foreclosure lane. In fact, he no longer owns the property. So bringing her on early on will save you a lot of trouble. And it's also helped me and my team a great deal to understand that short sale process way more because she's on the call with us. And as she's speaking, we're learning more. So we, we can add value to other conversations when she's not present instead of just, you know, speaking to the seller and then bringing her on in the back end. I normally um, bring her on in the front end. That's all I wanted to add. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. So Maria and I, um, it was Easter. I remember, Maria, I was sitting in the airport and we were doing a conference call. Bill and I were headed out of town. Um, and... Um, so we're headed, we're headed out of town and we're talking to the seller and Maria's talking about the listing and all this stuff. And he gives me the third party authorization and we get it, that off to the bank and they're like, you know, too far gone. So had Maria not brought us in, like she said, she would have gone through the whole entire listing process and wasted her time, her team's time, her energy, and again, marketing dollars for the property that I think it went to sheriff's sale the next week, right? Maria, he never disclosed that. Like there wasn't, it wasn't even like, way far out, like close to the 37 days, like it was going to be gone like three days later. So, and he just didn't understand that. So that is hugely important that we jump in and reach out to that bank right away. Yeah. And then Denise's point, I mean, if, if someone's not paying a mortgage, um, odds are they're not paying other things. And, and when we are involved, that's why we pull title searches um, on every, every property that we're involved in, because we don't want any surprises. Um, I mean, Denise, I know you had a transaction, I'm not sure who it was with, but, you know, the HOA played hardball and it was, you know, some Sorry, extraordinary, yeah. was that Maria? Yeah. yeah. You know, but, but, but the homeowners and condo associations now, folks, if they see the for sale sign go in the yard, first thing they're going to do if the homeowners hasn't been paying their condos, they're going to put a judgment against it. They're going to put a lien against the property because they know they're standing between you and a sale. And they also know that there's multiple parties involved. So, well, hey, we normally, normally homeowner, HOA, condos, they only get six months of monthly payments if the lender forecloses and they wipe them out in a foreclosure action, all right? And HOAs, condos, they're all lawyered up now. They know this, but they also know that in a short sale, there's a buyer, there's a seller, there's a listing agent, there's a buyer's agent, there's a company like CK Capital. And they're like, you know what? We don't want six months. We want, instead of 5,000, we want 15 grand. And they know they can hold a deal up. So just, again, don't assume the homeowner, if they're saying they're delinquent on the mortgage, all right, odds are they could be delinquent on other things too. 
Um, we're coming down the home stretch here, just a couple uh, last slides. Um, lender review steps. So if you're on the buy side of a short sale and you can't figure out why it's not progressing, um, this is important. But on the sell side, this gives you a sense for what's the expectation for your homeowner? What's your expectation for contract with dates and things like that, okay? Majority of the mortgage companies follow this process, okay? Number one, how do you start a short sale process? Get an offer under contract. You're going to list the property, disclose that it is a short sale in the multi-listing, but the lender doesn't start the short sale review until they have an offer in hand. Until they have a sales contract, they don't know what kind of loss they're expected to take, okay? Once an offer is in hand, inside the mortgage companies, they have folks, they're mainly, most times they're called loss mitigation specialists. This is the individual inside of Bank of America, Wells Fargo, that, that handles that file and they oversee the process. They're not decision makers. Um, I, I, I often say they're like the quarterback, right? So they've got the ball. They've got the file in their hands. It's their job to make sure that underwriting does the financial review. It's their job to make sure that the appraisal gets ordered. It's their job to make sure the institutional investor, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, USDA, that they get the package for review once those other steps are completed. It's actually the institutional investor, the one that owns the mortgage, because the reality is Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, they've long sold off these loans. All right. They are doing billing and collecting. Fannie Freddie purchases about 50, 55 percent of all the mortgages that are generated out there. But once the investor says, yep, uh, homeowners qualified, the appraisal you know, is in line with with the offer amount we're going to go ahead and approve it. If the appraisal comes in higher than the offer, the, the lender, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they'll actually counter that offer. Once the, the uh, price is agreed to, all right, then the lender issues the short sale approval letter, then you can move to closing, okay? So it's those five steps. So if you're on the buy side and you're written on a short sale, ask the question, has a loss mitigation person been assigned yet? Has the appraisal been, com com been completed yet? Is it with the investor for review? When can we accept um, our decision? Most mortgage companies are taking anywhere from, on average, 45 to 60 days from offer submittal to complete this process to issue a final decision and approval. So just give, give your give use that as your guide you know, if you if you have a, a buyer that writes a contract and, and they want a decision in three weeks, you're going to need to educate them, all right, that it's going to take a little bit longer. But the industry norm right now is about 45 to 60 days, okay? And, and sometimes you can have a first lien that's getting paid off in full and you're just shorting the second. So if that's the case, if your first is paid off in full, just short a second, the, the process will be tweaked. So that's for, you know, two liens being shorted, et cetera, that, that average time. Um, but before we finish up, the only thing I want to touch it on real quickly, because this is coming up, which we think it's great. People raise their hands and a lot of them share things with us that we learn as well. Um, I'm related to us jumping in and you handling a listing. An agent raised her hand, like I said, in the last class and said, not only is it important to ask regarding forbearance to your seller, you also want to, she said, here's my situation. She said, I was representing the seller. My seller wasn't in forbearance. They were cruising along. They thought they were going to walk away with X amount of money, um, get it under contract. Again, it was not a short sale. So it's going to settlement. Um, the person was pre-approved do all their stuff and it gets into final underwriting. And this is two weeks before settlement, the buyer's loan is denied. And the buyer's loan is denied because of the fact that they were participating in the forbearance program and were in the middle of the forbearance. So that then they got a loan denial. 
The seller then had to put her house back on the market. The market had softened. She wound up having to sell it for $15,000 less because she sold it at, at the height six weeks prior, ready to go to settlement. So in, in our area, we're saying it is just as important if you're representing a buyer to say, did you ever participate? Just so you know, and you can say, hey, buyer's lender, this person is, is in the forbearance program. Is that going to affect anything, you know, later down the line once underwriting reviews this? And we're telling buyer's agent to somehow in a roundabout way say, hey, listing agent, you know, even if it's not a short sale, did any chance your buyers participated? Did you confirm that? However, you can do that in a professional way, but it is just as important that we have an added slide in for the buy side as well to ask these yeah. questions. There's a forbearance program um, basically indicates that the homeowner can't afford their mortgage. And, and how this person got a prequal, we don't know. But the reality is that you had folks that were taking advantage of this program to pocket money, put it aside for a down payment on a new home. They weren't necessarily struggling, but because they were in that program, the underwriter for the new loan said, hey, you were in forbearance. That means you can't afford the mortgage. I don't care what you're saying to me now. You were in a program where you didn't have the ability to make mortgage payments. All right, Denise, you want to finish up? We yeah. talked about how we work. You want to finish up how, how we get how we get paid on out of these transactions. Yeah, yeah. And and as I explain this, because we've had several deals with Chad and Maria, um, you guys can jump in and and kind of tell me how it maybe worked behind the scenes. Um, but our company is a buyer paid fee, but it is not a premium. So it's offset with closing cost help. So on the agreement of sale, the buyer comes in and they will, to offset our fee, they'll ask for 3% seller's assist from the short sale lender. So it's a credit, okay, from the short sale lender on the sell side to the buyer and our fee is paid on the buyer side of the settlement sheet as a line item, just like their other fees. But it ex it's explained to them it is a credit from the sell side and a debit on the buy side. So it's a wash in the event that the buyer is cash, though, of course, you know, the, the banks aren't going to help offer closing cost help for a cash buyer because $300,000 and 3% assist, 291 is the same as writing an offer for 291 for a cash buyer. So for a cash buyer, you lower the offer by 3% to offset our fee. And if you're financing, you ask for the 3% seller's assist. Um, our, our last deal, Maria, as you can validate, I mean, Maria just passes my number off to the buyer's agent and says, just let Denise explain it. It's not a premium. She'll go over it. I'll send them the language that they should put in the MLS. And it hasn't really, unless something's going on, Maria, behind the scenes, it hasn't been an issue, right? It, once I explain it to them, they, kind of, they get it, right? Yeah, the reason why I passed it on is because we kind of got into the dynamics of explaining it and there was more questions and more questions and more questions. So I'm a huge believer of saving time and just working efficiently. So I would just pass them on to Denise and then things would just kind of roll faster. Um, but I did want to add my little testimony. Working with Denise and Bill has been not only alleviating because I did short sales before on my own and it was a complete and total disaster because you have to kind of chase the bank. But also you know, not only are they saving time while you continue to work other deals and lead gen and all that great stuff, but you're learning a great deal. And that part is really where I find the value where it's like, I'm not a matter expert in short sale, but thanks to teaming up with them, I've learned so much. Every single conversation, I see the question she's asking. I see the different, right? Cause it's a different party. So it's a different question. It's a different scenario, different response. And so you're almost in the room shadowing her. And so that, that's been my testimony. It's been great. I, I always say this about my assistant, Jessica, but now Denise and Bill have jumped on that train. And it, they were short sale before Denise and Bill. And then there's short sale after Denise and Bill. Everything before the blur. 
Yeah. <laughs> now it's just like, it's a clear road. And now we're actually excited to do more shirt sales because they've, you know, alleviated that process. Yeah. And just the one thing, thank you, Maria, for those Thanks, comments. Maria. One thing I'll add is that um, for those of you that have not worked with us, we have documents for the seller. Client engagement letter explains what our services are to the seller, that there is no fee. Then we have a buyer package that gets uploaded in the MLS. We'll give you, you know, public remarks, recommended language. So there's no surprises. Um, it, and we understand in the Hawaii market that settlement assistance isn't a thing. So there's a little bit of educating there. Once, once the buyers go, oh, well, as long as it's a wash and you can explain it, it's a math equation, it's a debit and credit, you're not bringing any extra money to the table, you overcome that objection. But like we understand there's certain markets we go into, they don't have that model. Um, and then lastly, um, just, just to, before we do Q&A, um, Sarah had asked if I can email this presentation. Um, Chad, should I send that to Jewel? Yeah, you can send it to Jewel and Jewel will send it out to all the participants. Okay, so for everybody, you'll get a copy of this. Um, I'll email it out to Jewel when we're done today. All right. Um, any other comments or questions? Well, real quick, Chad, you didn't, did you have anything to add on like the few deals we've done together? It was pretty smooth with the fee, right? And the, just telling them to add the assist and... Super easy. It's not complicated. If if it sounds complicated, it's just because you're not used to it. But at the end of the day, the net effect to the buyer uh, and the seller is really zero. And not that uh, Bill and Denise don't want to uh, or they want to you know cut their commissions or anything like that. But in our case, when when if it comes down to being shaved, um, they they really fight for the real estate agent to maintain their commissions. Um, and in our case, they took a little bit of a of a discount as a result of it. Again, not that they want to, not that they deserve right. to, because they're they're unbelievable in the transaction, but they are such a, a great advocate and a business partner to have in, in transactions like this. And the, and the analogy that I gave before is, um, you know, you may have done, to, like Maria said, you may have done short sales uh, prior to. I, I've done a ton of them. Um, I could teach a class on short sales. I never want to do another one again. I really don't. I, I mean, if someone else is willing to do that, um, and not only do you do it, you do it like unbelievably well. Uh, and, and so in the future, I'm like, everything has to go to them. So I will send you all short sale business. Uh, I recommend for, for one thing, we're requiring all of our new agents that are in coaching. They got to use you anyway. That's, that's just a, a requirement. Agents that have experience, don't do the brain damage. Like there's no reason to do it. Just, just give it to them. They make it simple and easy. So you can go, go on to do what you're uh, better suited for where your superpower is go make other relationships with other uh, with other clients, buyers and sellers. Let them worry about this. This is where they where they shine. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. So anybody have questions on anything? It was a lot of information. I know it's a lot. And this is all new because we've never been through a pandemic like this before. So it's new for everybody as to what's going to happen with these banks out there. Huh. I will say, you know, if anyone's thinking about what to say, I'll say it on behalf of my agents. Thank you for giving us the the two cents on some lead generation stuff, guys. That that's some gold that they provided us with. I hope that you guys wrote that down and you're going to act on it because uh, that's amazing. Not only did they teach us about what short sales, uh, what that is, what the CARES Act is, and how it's applicable to us, um, how to use a short sale negotiator, but they also gave us huge value, which is how to go find short sale clients. Um, so thank you for, for throwing that, guy, that in there for us. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, I guess we're good. We appreciate it. Um, everybody enjoy your turkey day. And um, I'll be sure to uh, email that when we're done. But again, thank you all. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks, guys. Take care.